Well, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, uh, and representatives from the Jagiellonian University and the Polish University uh, abroad. Ja przepraszam, że niestety będę mówił po angielsku, ale później po dyskusji bym z przyjemnością mówił, mówił trochę po polsku. Um, what does the Jagiellonian University mean to me? Uh, in the uh, time that I've spent in academia, my first contact with the Jagiellonian University in Krakow was through the then rector under the previous administration in Poland, which was uh, Professor Sir Alex Poy. He was head of molecular biology in an institute at the Jagiellonian University, and I know that he served three terms, having been elected by the staff of the Jagiellonian University uh, uh, themselves. What many of you would not know is the high regard and international regard which Alex Coy was actually held by the whole molecular biology community worldwide. His work was excellent, and yet I observed firsthand the problems that a university in Central Europe was experiencing at that difficult time of the mid-1980s. What astounded me about the Jagiellonian University was the capacity of young investigators who not only had to keep up and keep up to date with the discoveries that were happening worldwide, which was difficult enough in its own right, but they had the ingenuity to devise new experimental systems and engage very actively with collaborations in many centers globally. That was something that you will all know how hugely difficult that was to do. And yet, the inspiration that they gave was that these young people were capable of doing it. At a personal level, for me, one of the greatest uh, honors that I've had bestowed uh, on me was to be made a member of the Academia Umiejętności of the Jagiellonian University. You have to understand that I'm a clinician. The honor that I particularly had was I was made a foreign member of the Academy's Natural Sciences section, which meant that they were honoring me for the basic science I was doing, not just for the clinical work I was engaged in. And that is something that has always remained very special for me, and particularly the day when my father and family were able to be here at the Polish Embassy when I was given that particular award. So I feel very strongly about the building of bridges between ancient universities. But then let's consider what are the characteristics of great universities today. My university, Cambridge, and the Jagiellonian uh, too, share characteristics with other great universities in the world. And I'm going to try and break those characteristics down to four crucial areas. Firstly, academic breadth coupled with excellence. Breadth alone doesn't do it, excellence doesn't do it. You need the combination. Secondly, freedom. Thirdly, a unified mission to teach and to research. And fourthly, global ambition. I will try and deal with all four, but as you will note from the title of my address, I will pay more attention to the second two and explain the links between research and importance of a university in today's globalized world. First, let me touch on breadth coupled with excellence. In a university, it is a challenge to maintain breadth as well as excellence when society and government emphasize science and technology for their contribution to economic wealth, funding regimes and prestige tends to mirror that emphasis. But universities were not born out of science and technology, but really from a study of the arts, philosophy chief among them, but also music, grammar and rhetoric. It also then brought in the, uh, the humanities, principally law and theology. We as world leading uh, uh, universities also contribute to the cultural wealth of society in ways less tangible but no less important than technological discoveries. 
all universities to justify their name must cherish breadth. And ancient universities find the arts and humanities at the core of their long history. Moreover, in a world torn by political, cultural, and religious conflicts, scholarship and education in the humanities and social sciences are surely more important in today's world than they ever were in the past. This, in my experience, is universally understood. My Cambridge colleagues in the natural sciences and technology, and even ministers of governments whose focus is on economic growth above all, share the high value that I attach to cultural enrichment and to keeping these subjects not just alive but confident and crackling with their own excitement. In my discipline, medicine, we can keep people alive if the conditions are right, probably to the age of 100. But if I challenge you, what's the point of living to 100 if you don't have the arts and humanities? So secondly, let me turn to freedom. And I believe there has to be a great deal of it. There must be freedom in the air that we breathe on university campuses. The freedom to explore new pathways, to think, write, and argue beyond that which is conventional, or for that matter, comfortable. This is important as we teach students to think for themselves and not as others would have them think. That's what great universities do. There can be no real university without these underlying social and societal freedoms. In some societies, though, asserting them is enough to land you in prison. And that certainly pertained at different times in the history of both Britain and Poland. The challenges we confront in the UK and now in Poland, though, are different. They are much more subtle and come as much from within us as from without. Academic freedom of the kind I have described is inherently inefficient. It is the freedom to take risks and to fail, the freedom to go up blind alleys for months or years on end. Pressures that academics place on themselves, self-imposed pressures, as well as those externally imposed, to be efficient, productive, and successful are no bad thing in some measure. But there are risks to relevance and self-imposed efficiency. What we end up with is constraining the productive inefficiencies of free inquiry to snuff out the spark that is at the heart of creativity, discovery, and innovation. So one defining feature of world-leading universities is their longevity. Universities are for the long term. I'm not only speaking of universities like Cambridge and the Jagiellonian University, but of all universities. Because the act of establishing a university is a statement of permanence. Universities are expected to last. And they have a responsibility to the past and to the future. And I believe that that transcends their responsibility to the present. So for that reason, if no other, universities need independence. If they are too strongly influenced by governments or by industry, then they will focus too strongly on the short term, on the immediate problem that we want to solve because that is what governments and industry have to do. There is an opposite and a balancing problem. Universities are responsible to society and society needs a way to judge their usefulness. Universities can't be allowed to say, leave us alone while we think high and refined thoughts. Our concerns are not those of society. So universities need freedom, but freedom is hard won. They must be independent, but they must be accountable at the same time.
Believe me, that is a very difficult trick to pull off. But it is vital if a university in today's world is to be successful. Now, as I said from the outset, my remarks will be on mostly on the last two areas. A unified mission to teach and research. And the unity of teaching and research is absolutely vital. What I hope I can show you is that universities like ours can contribute to the chaotic planet that we have today. They are unique places. They're not the only institutions that perform research. Companies do it, as do public and private research institutes. They're not actually the only institutions that teach beyond secondary uh, school level. Technical colleges and institutes of technology do that equally well. Liberal arts colleges do it in different disciplines. But universities are the only institutions which combine higher teaching and research across a full range of disciplines from philosophy to nanotechnology and to use their strength in research to educate students through research up to and beyond all the boundaries of current knowledge. Some will think it odd that I need the word research in my title at all. The role of research universities in the global world. It is necessary for two reasons. First, a matter of philosophy, which is largely historical, but has contemporary resonances. And secondly, because of contemporary diversity among today's universities. Let me deal with the history first. When His Holiness Pope Benedict the Sixteenth visited the United Kingdom a couple of years ago, he beatified an English intellectual, Cardinal John Henry Newman. In academic circles, Newman's most celebrated writing was termed the idea of a university. It was a series of published lectures given in 1852 to mark the foundation of the then called Catholic University of Ireland, of which he would be head. Now his university leadership was not great, a saint he may be, but a vice chancellor he was useless at. Because within 10 years the university had failed and was closed down. And from its foundations rose the University College Dublin, but it isn't the Catholic University of Ireland as envisaged by Newman. But these lectures are still the subject of scholarly attention and debate because they help us to frame some questions about the purpose of modern universities and the creation of intellectual capital. The assembled audience in 1852 for these lectures that would become his book were 400 or so of the leading Catholic lay and clergy of Ireland. Remember, Ireland at that time was a Protestant country which was largely Catholic in orientation. Um, the government was Protestant orientated and the Church of Ireland was actually affiliated to the Church of England. And there was no education available at higher levels for Catholic uh, students. He would later describe his experience as speaking to all of the intellect, or almost all of it, and almost all of Dublin were there. Newman himself was there as the first head of a new university, and had been appointed by the Pope in November of the preceding year. Now this set of lectures is renowned. People like me, and in my experience many academics who work in universities, enjoy asking ourselves the question of what are universities for? And sooner or later in any of those discussions, Newman will always come up. Now the lectures are particularly famous these days for a single phrase which is emphasized throughout. And that is knowledge for its own sake. And defining the nature and benefits of a liberal education as opposed to education with a specific goal in mind such as, from a student's perspective, getting a job, or from a government's perspective, training people for industry so they can be economically productive for the country. He rejected those arguments totally. 
and the arguments he marshals are powerful enough to ensure that he remains a reference point even today. But it's important if we consider these to view these discourses in their historical context. The impetus for the foundation of the new institution lay squarely with teaching, moral and religious instruction, as well as dissemination of academic disciplines. This was a Catholic university. Now, I have to tell you, I find reading these, this book, it's 500 pages, almost impossible. It is a chore. I only managed to get through it through two long flights there and back to Los Angeles, but that's about the only way. It was more effective than either alcohol or tomazepam to put you to sleep. And it's an incredibly difficult text. The language is dense, and it's very dated, and it's confusing. Frankly, it's easier to read Shakespeare, and certainly easier to read Jane Austen, than to parse Newman's early Victorian sentences. But I stuck with the task, and remembering two principles that he had. The first has got a lot going for it, and that is education, as I've said, for its own sake. But his second, I have real problems with, because he stated that universities are places for teaching, not research. The first is championed by today's academics as an ideal, at least in the UK. And frankly, the second has been thought for the last 25 years or so to miss an astonishing opportunity. And personally, I find the separation of teaching and research in large modern universities deeply problematic. The first principle of a university for Newman is not apparent until well into the discourses. You have to get through 200 pages of verbiage. The concept of pursuing knowledge for its own sake capable of being an end in itself and a good in itself, and he describes that as liberal knowledge. It promotes a liberal philosophy, aiming for the perfection of the intellect as a goal in itself, without a prior agenda. It is a good in itself. The approach, in fact, lends itself to a classical British tradition of producing generalists rather than specialists or to put it in Cambridge terms, educate the mind and the educated can turn their hand to almost anything. Though that would not have been Newton's choice of justification, because he would never have agreed that education should have a secular usage at all. Still, it did shape British attitudes to education for about 50 to 100 years. And I consider that this argument has much to commend it for the following reason. More specific, focused, or primarily professional education is important. It's important for society, it's important for countries. But it runs the risk of prejudging what will be needed in the future. When in all disciplines, especially the sciences, Progress now is so rapid that predictions of utility are frankly futile. I could not write out a course for you now which would tell you what a doctor or a clinician would be doing in 30 years' time. When technology is changing so rapidly and our planet is changing so rapidly, it is better to educate people in how to solve problems rather than simply to teach them a problem that has been solved. However, as a theorist on universities, Newman had predecessors. And indeed, even the title of the discourses is plagiarism. The idea of a university was not invented by Newman. Theories on the purposes and development of the modern university actually begin with the Germans, particularly Wilhelm von Humboldt, when he was establishing the University of Berlin in 1810. And through his diktats, it influenced the whole of Europe, especially the free university of movement. And these universities were the dominant force in Europe as a whole, including Britain, up until about 1914. But most importantly, they influenced the development of universities in the United States, which are essentially Humboldtian. 
His theme, in contrast to Newman, was entirely different as a philosophy. It was around a union of teaching and research, and the pursuit of advancement of knowledge by a disinterested search for truth, but with the shared engagement of scholars and students to this purpose, i.e. the university is a holistic entity which involves students and scholars in a shared purpose and mission. And that concept is rejected by Newman. That Humboldtian approach was embedded in British universities historically by Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert. We have to remember that Prince Albert came to Britain and was rejected by most of the British hierarchy as being a German. And as a consequence, he stood as the head of Imperial College here in London, and he stood for election, the last time an election for a chancellor was held at the University of Cambridge. And he was opposed in that election by an English peer who stood on the single platform, we cannot have a German leading a major British university. You wouldn't get away with it today, he'd be in court tomorrow, but those were the days. Prince Albert won by three votes. But he set about changing one of Britain's major universities from a church-based institution into an institution that was based on that Humboldtian principle. Germany then moved away from the Humboldtian principle, but it was embedded in the United States and Britain, which is why our universities have a different foundation and direction to, much of the, to many of the universities in continental Europe. But in Polish universities, in the Jagiellonian University, university research was front and center in the same way. In my own field, medicine, I recognized that the functioning of adrenaline and the identification of the typhoid microbe as achievements of the 19th century Jagiellonian University. In fact, it's quite something when you go and look at some of the original papers from there. Karol Olszewski and Zygmunt Wroblewski liquefied oxygen and nitrogen from the air in Krakow, while their counterparts in history and law were helping to make prominent contributions to the rethinking of an old and in the early 80s and 90s, a young nation that was emerging. Why this importance of the breadth of coverage of a university? Where would the country have turned to if it didn't have that academic breadth? So research for the sake of curiosity and for the sake of usefulness is actually found in abundance at the Angolonian University. Our cultures are very similar. And after all, it was the alma mater of Copernicus, so I mean, uh, what a greater uh, place could it have than that itself? But here I go back to Newman, and this is the element that's distressing to me. Newman quoted and lauded in all academic circles. But let me just read to you the first paragraph of the preface to the idea of a university. You need go no deeper than the first paragraph. And he writes, the view taken of a university in the discourses which form this volume is of the following kind, that it is a place of teaching universal knowledge. This implies that its object is on the one hand intellectual, not moral, and on the other that it is the diffusion and extension of knowledge rather than its advancement. If its object were scientific and philosophical discovery, I do not see why a university should have students. And that is where I part company with a great thinker. He wanted to separate the two functions of teaching and advancement, that is research, which Humboldt had tried to unify. And I find this rejection of research as a proper purpose of a university particularly difficult to understand. In these lectures, he's trying to sell a concept albeit to a particular Catholic audience. But I cannot exonerate Newman on these grounds. He states this position time and time and time again, even later in the preface. He believes that research is best carried out in institutes, since to discover and to teach are distinct functions 
They are also distinct gifts and are not commonly found united in the same person. Now all I can say in response to that, and I look at all my academic colleagues in Cambridge and in the, at the Anglonian University, and all I can say is, I'm sorry Cardinal Newman, you may be a saint, but I beg to differ. At one level, Newman's emphasis on education cannot be faulted. Every bit as important as research is in our role as educators and the students we send forth as citizens and leaders of the future. In recent decades, led by the sciences, the research budgets of most research-intensive universities have been growing fast. The fraction of an operating budget of a modern global university that supports educational activities is fast diminishing as a result. If you just consider Cambridge financially, 85% of the income of the university comes through research, 15% through education. In research intensive universities everywhere, they receive less academic acclaim and reward for uh, discoveries in education than they do in research. This combination of circumstances is a cause for concern because it risks a subtle but real drift away from the educational mission that is ever more vital for the contribution and leadership the world will need tomorrow. So Newman might have privileged education over research. We have to beware that in today's world we don't privilege research over education. The balance is what really is needed. Therefore the dual mission of a modern university to teach and to research, to combine to place postgraduate level education at the heart of, of the unique contributions universities at the Jagiellonia and the Cambridge can make. And that emphasis on the postgraduate sometimes puts us in conflict with politicians who focus on the undergraduate. Now research is a very exciting vocation for any student, whatever your, uh, your discipline. There is a description of soldiers at war and indeed of pilots who fly passenger aeroplanes, although I find it rather more frightening that the experience is described as long periods of boredom interspersed with moments of sheer terror. Next time you're on a flight, just think of that. The life of the researcher, if he or she is lucky, includes astonishing moments of rapture when you see something for the first time that nobody has ever thought of or seen before. But believe me, the hard grind means that you spend years before you get that one moment of Eureka, uh, so prized by the Greeks. Research today is informed by considerations, very often, of the eventual use to which discoveries could one day be put. Now, Donald Stokes wrote in his book in 1997 called Pasteur's Quadrant, with a reference, of course, to Louis Pasteur, whose breakthroughs were an, uh, led to an understanding of infectious diseases that this was motivated by a desire to alleviate human suffering he saw. But that isn't the true motivation of research. Pasteur did fundamental research. His motivation might have lain, and inspiration might have come from the world around him, but it also was dependent on that internal spark of the researcher to study a problem which is purely fundamental and then to apply it to usefulness to society. Now, Fermat's last theorem, I don't know how many of you are mathematicians, resolved after 357 years, and of course I would say by a Cambridge educated theoretician called Andrew Wiles, and he was working on his own, paper and pencil, that's how he actually solved it. Mathematical theory has underpinned all of science since the work of another Cambridge mathematician called Isaac Newton. But theory and blue skies research will remain utterly necessary and endeavors are the ultimate source of all new disruptive technologies uh, and unanticipated discoveries that can truly be world changing and universities have to give the time and space for those unexpected discoveries to happen. That's quite a challenge. So Crick and Watson were working in the Cavendish laboratory in Cambridge, physicists actually, not biologists, 
And they were determined to solve a problem, which was the structure of DNA. They did not know anything about DNA sequencing or what it would lead in the world of today. They were interested in what do these little dots on an X-ray plate actually mean in terms of the structure of that molecule. And they played around with bits of Meccano and Lego and bits of wire and blobs to put the atoms in the right place. They weren't fascinated by the problem of what DNA might help solve in the future. They were interested in the problem that they were approaching. They have created and spun off lucrative industries, jobs for millions of people subsequently. They didn't know that that would ever happen. They were just interested in the problem. We should note, though, that more and more research by Crick and Watson, which can still be properly characterized as fundamental, is now pursued with a clear and explicit bearing upon the serious problems the world faces. The physical world, the social world, and actually our world as human beings. And this goes back to a concept that I tried to introduce before, that universities cannot and do not exist in a vacuum. They are part of society. Indeed, you can argue a creation of society, and therefore, I would contend, have to be relevant to that society. This is enshrined in Cambridge University's mission statement. I'm sure you've seen lots of mission statements of every organization. This is one of the shortest I've ever encountered. It merely says, to serve society through teaching, research, and learning to the highest international standards. That's it. That's what Cambridge is about. But within those words, there are multiplicity of nuances. Therefore, rightly in the service of society, more and more attention is given to the prompt transfer of discoveries and innovation for the benefit of that society. And more and more academics work closely with private sector partners and identifiable innovation ecosystems are emerging around the world. I will contend that is a good thing that is happening and it helps promote fundamental research itself. So let me describe Cambridge's well-established innovation ecosystem as an example of boundary crossing and partnership across the academic private sector divide. Cambridge is a small place. The city is 100,000 people. You know, in some countries, a little more than a village. It's surrounded by a population which will add up to a total of 600,000 people. So just bear that in mind as a, a, a context. About 1% of the United Kingdom population. And yet, it's been the nucleus of significant biotechnology and IT clusters developing over a 50-year period. Its prominence has properly diminished as these clusters have developed. We don't want to drive it from the university. We want them to become self-standing entities. But it remains the innovation hub that drives the myriad and acts like a magnet to a myriad of ventures that surround themselves around Cambridge. So how big is it? For Cambridge, with a population of 600,000 people, the university has been engaged in the establishment of 1,525 companies. Twelve of these are now valued at over 1 billion US dollars, and two at over 10 billion dollars. And the cluster now employs 53,000 people in terms of a population of 600,000. And it's changed society itself as 25% of the total workforce in Cambridgeshire now work in knowledge-intensive uh, universities. The average for Britain is 12%. So one in four are in knowledge-intensive universities. You're changing the nature of society by acting as an innovation hub. The University of Cambridge itself, through the Tech Transfer Office, now holds equity in 66 spin-out companies, which I have to support. Over 1,000 university researchers are at various stages of securing their intellectual property. We only have 1,500 academic staff. It pervades every single discipline of the university. And 80% of spin-out companies forged in Cambridge will go on to second round funding. The national average is about 50%. So it's a successful area. But weight of numbers is not the point, nor at least the primary point. What is important is the permeable boundaries between academia and industry. 
You work together. You forge partnerships with the private sector. The private sector doesn't try to interfere with academic freedom. We don't try to interfere or constrain uh, industry from making money, creating jobs, and creating economic growth. We can and do work together. And it makes the university, I believe, a more exciting place rather than a less ex exciting place. And that's the real point. To those of you who would suggest that this is a distraction from the primary purpose of the university, and it distracts from the blue skies, big thinking research, I just point out to you that that research thrives in Cambridge as well. And if I have to attest or give you evidence, then 89 Nobel Prizes will actually suffice for, for my purposes. So academics are challenged and motivated to build translational partnerships for a variety of reasons. It's to realize that the critical mass of research activities provides those reasons, and some of the spin-outs work in developing countries, other with new discoveries, new devices, new diagnostics, new materials, new chips and technology. Frankly, the mobile phone and much of that actually owes its existence to the university. And what I conclude from that experience is that ecosystem is indeed the right metaphor for these clusters. They're diverse in composition, they interact in complex and chaotic ways, they are not managed in the conventional way. They're non-linear. Nurturing them requires a culture of openness, transparency, a spirit of entrepreneurism that pervades the whole university, and a lot of flexibility. Creative chaos. Frankly, best managed by an infrastructure, not a superstructure, and a sound policy environment. One that is forgiving of failure, and one that enables us to take those ideas forward. Don't try and impose order on a chaotic system. Anybody knows that any government that's ever tried that fails automatically. Give freedom. And the next big challenge is how do we take these place-specific activities at Cambridge and how do we build the collaborations with Silicon Valley, Bangalore, Singapore, Beijing, or so this global ambition brings me to the final value of the four I outlined. The global sphere of activity of a modern university. Universities are crossing international boundaries with increasing frequencies. In fact, if online education takes its place, universities will have no national boundaries and no national adherence at all. Cambridge will not be constrained to the fens of Britain, and the Jagiellonian University in 10 years' time will not be constrained to the region uh, uh, of South East Poland. It just will not uh, be the case. And there are many good reasons. We are educating citizens as leaders for an interconnected world, which many of today's students will go and live and work in different national and cultural settings for the course of their lives. The second is that the search for solutions to the challenges of our modern world are global. No one university has all the expertise, not even Harvard or Stanford, has all the expertise to solve the energy crisis today. We have to work together. And the third is quite simply to be of service. And maybe the society we're looking to serve is a global society and not just a local or regional or national society. So my university is moving along a line of transition. It is moving from one distinct mode of internationalism to having two. The first centers on the individual. Cambridge welcomes and has been welcoming scholars for centuries. So has the Jagiellonian University. Cambridge academics undertake all of their own travels. We've educated students from abroad for almost as long. Our researchers publish jointly with their counterparts in universities around the world, and they set up those links. I don't tell them to set up those links. In fact, if I did, probably they'd never happen. It's only by that bottom-up approach of individuals making those connections. And we've chosen partnership as the word which we will strive to in the world of today. That we want to work alongside other institutions and other academics as equals in the academic world so that we can work together 
to solve big problems. Not a top-down imposition, not a bottom-up forcing of the activity, but making it happen because we are research-led or education-led and have a joint vision of what is required. It can reflect a symbiosis between two institutions of equal strength or a conscious attempt by one institution to help build capacity in the other in a freely open and academic way. This bottom-up collaboration works for us and it, concrete results are far more long-lasting than top-down imposition. And we will band together with other research-led universities in the future to make this happen. I personally am going to be at the Anglo-Union University in April and I do hope we'll be having some discussions to see whether that can develop in more concrete interactions between Cambridge and Crackle. So far I've defined what I think the values are of modern universities. What are the roles that we actually play? We're regarded as crucial national assets. Governments worldwide will see us as vital sources of new knowledge, of innovative thinking, as providers of skilled personnel, credible credentials, contributors to innovation, attractors of international talent, business investment opportunities, and agents of social justice and mobility, and of course contributors to social and cultural vitality. But of course, as Newman said, we're also warehouses of knowledge which we pass on from one generation to another. We're cultural institutions, and if you're lucky enough to be the Agalonian University of Cambridge, we're national and regional symbols. All of that is fantastic, but they're not a university's primary purpose. They are wonderful byproducts of a relentless focus on excellence in teaching and research. That is the primacy of the mission, and all the rest can only happen if you never compromise on that fact. And that focus is the best contribution that we can make to society. One wonderful way in which uh, a focus on research excellence can help global society is by encouraging the development of similar expertise in the developing world. We have our own Centre for African Studies, the researchers from the School of Medicine, the veterinary school, work in different parts of the world. I spent some of my professional life working a long time in West Africa. But they come to create a project which helps bind local universities and teaches governments that may not understand the importance of freedom of expression and academic freedom, so hard won here in Europe. We have to be able to say, it is good that universities are critical of government. It is the way forward. We will strive to train those from developing countries, but I would rather ensure that we transfer that education to those countries so that they can remain vibrant themselves. Now, Poland and the United Kingdom are bound to each other within the framework of the European Union. And although it's a task I've had thrown on me in Britain, probably as a result of my surname, which sounds quite funny in Whitehall to, to many people, uh, that I've always been asked to lead for so many issues for Europe. And what Europe does know is that British universities are among the strongest proponents and supporters of a strong Britain in a strong European context. For the future, 20% of Cambridge's budget will be coming from Brussels, not from Whitehall. That's the sort of diversification that we are seeing happening in the world as we speak today. So the European Union really matters. And the capacity within that union to engage jointly is really important. Uh, Cambridge has links with Giovanna Gora, uh, for example, in the Erasmus Material Sciences area. Maybe we can develop them with other institutions. And the onset of the European Research Council is absolutely vital to make sure that Europe, as a regional sector, is able to be competitive with North America, with the Far East, and with South Asia. We are living in a global world, and it's vital for our young academics that they feel they can achieve in a European context. The bilateral research relationships are motivated either by equal partnership, where each partner brings skills and capabilities needed by the other, or by desire to build capacity or raise the level of achievement of the partner. Partnerships of equals are easy to find at the level of the individual researcher. Pockets of excellence will appear everywhere. 
All of the five, 1,596 Cambridge academics, that's all they are, we're a very small institution, will have bilateral research uh, uh, collaborations. In fact, I looked up the data, academics from Cambridge and the Jagiellonian University have published 107 publications together in the last 10 years. That's quite something. But if I tell you that 48 of those publications have been published because they work jointly in the big, large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is made possible through investment in infrastructure on the wider European stage. If Europe doesn't stick together in academic terms, it will fall apart and it will not be competitive in the world of tomorrow. So, bringing it all together and to conclude, I believe there are prerequisites for international collaboration between research universities. First and foremost, a shared and an absolute belief in excellence. No compromises on excellence. Second, a commitment to research and discovery, and please ignore if you can hear him the sounds of complaints from Cardinal Newman. But thirdly, institutional autonomy, freedom. It is clear to me that the periods in the history of the Anglonian University, when it was at its most productive and successful, were precisely the periods when it had control of its own fate and sufficient resources to exercise that control the 15th, the 16th century, the 19th century, and now in modern times. It's great seeing this renaissance. When restrictions were placed on the nationality of students attending, or on the content of the curriculum, or the language of tuition, the quality of research and education started to fall, and the institution needed to be rescued, most often by the courage of its own faculty members. And they did this because they did not want this fantastic institution to slide into irrelevance. And I look forward to visiting the university. And the last time I was in Poland, in the summer of 2011, I had the pleasure and honor of addressing, the, under the Polish presidency, the ministerial conference on the European research area in Sopot. What I said in that speech, because I can't put it any better again, is as follows. In an economic environment of austerity and cutbacks, Autonomy appears a luxury, and governments attempted to create incentives for universities that are fine-grained in terms of desirable outcomes and heavy-handed in terms of rewards or penalties. Governments know what they want, economic growth, but autonomy is not a luxury. It is an absolute and indispensable condition for excellence, and every step which tends to remove the power of universities to decide who they educate and how and what they research and why is a step towards mediocrity and paralysis. And I don't believe either Cambridge or the Jagiellonian University would want to see that. So I stand by that view and Cardinal Newman, vigilant against rule by church or state, actually deep down I think knew this in 1852 and its relevance today cannot be overstated. Thank you very much.